Hi, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Mark, I've got some questions from our members for this fortnight. Um, quite a few varied ones, but we'll start with Ada. She's bought a new horse. She should do groundwork or in-hand walking away from her other two or let them follow? Um... I think a little bit of both is good. Like, I mean, if you've bought a new horse and you want to sort of get them used to being with you and um, getting more confidence and connection with you and responding to you, um, you know, a bit of groundwork, taking them. So so what you could start with, I suppose, is just being with the other horses, working, so your horse is in a, you know, a confident um, frame of mind with, with some other horses around it and then slowly go away from the other horses uh, in with the other horses, things like that, away from the other horses with the other horses, and then even if they want to follow, you can let them follow. But you're just trying to build up um, its confidence with going way with you, and it's very important to show the horses that you're going to bring them home. So allowing your horse to go away and back and um, connecting with the horse, with the other horses in its calm environment, will only allow for a, a stronger a connection and, and uh, for you to take that connection further away on its own. But in most cases, I've found that if you show the horse, you can take it away and bring it back safely and, and keep it sort of centred with you a little bit more. And um, then then you can go further and further till you can take it away on its own. But mixing it up is really important to be with the other horses and to be away from them. They're both important. Okay, this is a question from Cornelia. It's about biting. My horse tries to bite me at specific times. Is it dominance, pain, and what should I do when she tries? Um, biting is an interesting one without knowing the signals and the background and things like that. Um, I, I'm not really sure which one of those it is. Basically it's an expression, biting is just an expression. So, um, so like say for instance, like I've, I've um, you know, I did a little uh, ride up um, on, on shutdown horses a little while ago and you know what I was saying in that and what I believe is a shutdown horse is a horse that was not allowed to express its feelings okay so um and not 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 in charge of its thoughts in a sense so so we micromanage the horse so much so that we control it that it uh be it believes that it's not allowed to think so it just um sometimes shuts down all those emotions so you can get shut down horse and start to communicate with it and then all those emotions come out and they start to bite and um some of that biting is just saying, I don't like that, so it's not dominant, it's, it's, it's a self-preservation, it's a horse feeling like it has to stand still. So for instance, say, say you know, you heard um, fight, flight, freeze, um, you know, you hear that a lot in, 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 in around horses. Well, uh, if a horse is starting to express itself, but it still thinks it has to stand still and be obedient, well, it may start to keep its feet still and start to say, I don't like that and bite. Sometimes horses can bite to be a little protective of their space because they're a little uncomfortable with you coming in. But it's more of expression of saying, um, you know, it can be a protection thing, and but it can also be a dominance thing. It could be an expression of pain. It can be any one of those. Um, but basically, um, you can curve biting behaviour. Now, some biting is, can turn into just a horse testing and... and uh, uh, and it can be a horse just, just being a bit playful and things like that, so they'd be a bit nippy, but the playful nips are not those real hard-eyed, hard-faced where there's t I've got a tight face and really tight ears and that real snarly look. Uh, a, 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 another nip might be a little of a softer look, but the horse is nipping, but it's not nipping very hard, as in it tests and tests your skin, and, it's not, and that's more of a, yeah, a, a, a playful nip that you may want to engage in, you may not want to engage in, but... <clears throat> it's just just the horse communicating but nipping is something that we're allowed to show our horses what we do and we don't like and it's important to um, you know some people get pushy and shovey with some nipping and it just creates more of a challenge so the horse nips more and becomes more aggressive whereas in some cases I just not engage with it if it's just a bit of a testing nip or things like that or a playful nip um, I wouldn't engage with it. I just stand quietly and go I'm not really interested in that if it was a little too pushy and the horse was kind of um, overbearing, uh, then I'd change his thoughts. So, I'd, I, you know, if you if you just banged your lead rope on your leg or something or popped, popped your poppers or, or popped a flag or something just to change their thought, to snap them out of that thought, that, that's good too. Um, but if it's pain, 
you've got to delve into that and find out if it's pain. So, you know, I hear a lot of stories of horses with stomach ulcers and things like that that start to get really snarly behaviour during saddling and things like that. And those horses are sort of expressing that they're in pain and it, it is a, an aggressive, um, you know, thing because they're protecting themselves, I guess. So it is a... Um, you know, so any of those nips could have some sort of, you know, protective can turn into dominance. But if you're walking up to a horse, uh, so so a, a dominant nip could be a horse protecting another horse. So sometimes you go near another horse, and another horse comes over and tries to bite at you. Well, that becomes quite a dominant nip because it's saying, "Go away, get away from us," or things like that. Um, and and those those nips, you, you know, you could if you read the herd a bit better and walked in a little differently, maybe you wouldn't get that nip or that conflict with the horse but also maybe if you um <clears throat> if the horse kind of does that anything around you and you haven't really interfered with it and it gets coming out of its area to be aggressive towards you then um a, a quick change of thought's always important so around those horses obviously you're going a little bit more prepared though This is a question from Anne. It's about endless mouthing. She has a four-year-old who she thinks may have ADD. Uh, he never stops, even just hanging out with him in the paddock. His mouth is grabbing at me constantly. When I go to catch him, he immediately grabs the bit of the halter to play with it. During training, it's endless and makes it difficult to achieve anything as he's constantly grabbing the rope with his teeth. I've tried engaging with him. I've tried putting my fingers in his mouth. Neither makes any difference. I've tried a reprimand and backing him up, but I don't feel that's the answer, as every interaction just becomes an endless session of backing, and he doesn't seem to care, just goes straight back to chewing and grabbing on the rope. Even putting his rug on, he grabs at my clothes or mouths my legs, arms, etc., and he does it to other horses as well, and they rarely hang out too close to him. I often see him playing with sticks in the paddock, and no way can I leave rugs hanging on the fence. Having ridden this out, it seems obvious now that boredom is the issue. I'm trying to ditch the old methods and embrace the new but it's pretty obvious waiting and breathing is not his thing any suggestions for an ADD type young horse who really needs boundaries as you've mentioned is kind of driving me crazy <laughs> that's an interesting one because um, the hardest thing for me it's not hard when I do a clinic I can do a clinic and teach people and I'm only working with their horse at the time and, the, and that person so I'm only dealing with that particular horse's behaviour and possibly looking at the reasons behind that behaviour. So when you when I put a sort of, you know, I write something or I put a little video up that people sort of want to follow, it's very easy to sort of go, oh, is that for my horse or not for my horse? Um, and, and not work out, you know, if you should do it or not. And that's what I always worry about with education. But by the sounds of your horse and by... Um, the description and thank you for the description because sometimes that description helps me uh, paints a picture of, of why the horse is doing it and it sounds like you've sort of been pretty good at figuring out it out in the sense that you know it could be just a playful horse that's quite bored and maybe the old other horses aren't that playful and he just needs another another colt or another young horse that wants to get up and wrestle with him just to sort of like like two pups you know or you see a litter of pups rolling around rolling around and then one board pup annoys mum and mum's like, oh, go away. But while that other, those pups have got a few other pups to, to, to wrestle with, they're, 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 you know, got some, some others to play with and engage with. And some horses just are a lot more playful than other horses. So, um, yeah. But it's okay to set boundaries. And, and, you know, I'm dealing with things a lot at clinics. And engaging is important with horses. But, you're, you know... I encourage people to engage with horses that previously wouldn't engage with people and, um, and you know, shut down horses and horses that are really frightened of people and things like that. And as soon as they communicate with you and you want to sort of show them that you're available and you want to listen to them. But you get a horse like that that's in your face and always constantly engaging with you, then it's got to know when and when not to do things. And it's okay to set boundaries. So. But how do you set those boundaries? So, so you know, you would see me sometimes get a rope and say, step back a little bit. That can become like a yo-yo game with a horse. So sometimes I like to give a horse responsibility. So the difference with uh, saying something in a certain way 
um, that's effective or not effective is where we want to hand over the responsibility to the horse, not our responsibility. So, so basically, if you had a horse that's constantly mouthing and engaging, you go step back, and the horse engages with you again, you step back. That's almost saying to the horse, that's almost saying, I'll stop you from doing that. So I'm gonna be responsible for you not mouthing on me all the time and playing with me all the time. Whereas I say, it's your responsibility to not mouth me all the time. Um, so I would give the horse a bit of responsibility. A good lesson might be just stand with that rope and I might just have a long rope and I'll just put the rope on the ground and if the horse doesn't stand with the rope, I'll just pop the flag and say, focus, and the horse will go, focus on what? And, and, and then it'll realise it's to focus on that rope that's just sitting quietly on the ground. I mean, you've still got it in your hand, it's just laying on the ground. But basically you set up a task. The responsibility for you is to stand with that rope quietly and learn to stand quietly. And, um, and, and until the horse can stand quietly and you just shock him or disrupt that thought um, when he gets that mouthy thought. And it's much the same if he was standing beside you. You disrupt that thought effectively enough that he goes, oh, I won't do that again, which means it's got to have a bit of a shock to it. So he goes, oh, but you're not bringing the argument to him and you're not pushing him back and pushing him back and pushing him back. You're just saying, don't do that, um, which means you could pop a flag very effectively. So he goes, oh, oh, oh okay, all right. Oh, I'll just stand here quietly then. But what I mean with it is don't say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. You're trying to say, do this, stand quietly. So in your mind, you're setting it up to say, if you see his mind start to wriggle and start to squirm, you know he's not standing quietly, so you quickly go, stand quietly. And he'll go, okay, oh, oh, oh right, you want me to stand quietly, okay. And that's putting the responsibility back at him. But it's so easy to be slightly ineffective with what we're asking and going, we stop doing that, we stop doing that, we stop doing that all the time, and then it becomes a, a bit of a game after a while, and the horses go, oh, I engage with you, and you engage with me, and I engage with you. So I don't step into the horse and say, don't do that, because I'm engaging with that. I'm just saying, hey, change that thought. Um, there was something I was going to also say on that, but um, another thing is, is a, a simple reaction. Like, sometimes you can be quite effective with um, a, a sort of body pulse like that. So, you know, you've you ever seen a horse when they've got flies on them and they sometimes just go, you see their skin ripple and the flies just go away. Well, sometimes I'm standing with horses that are coming in and they kind of like a little bit funny. I, I don't pay any attention to it, but I know out of the corner of my eye what they're doing. And I do this quick, like, shiver through my body, but a very fast shiver. And, and they go, oh, what was that? Okay, and then they come in again and you do a very fast shiver and they go, oh, oh, well, maybe they don't want me to engage with them and I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just going to stand here quietly then. And, you know, just little things like that, instead of you turning around and sort of focusing on your horse and saying, don't do that, you just have this kind of really quick shiver, and if you're really good and effective with it, they just go, oh, oh, well, that didn't work. Okay, and I'll stop doing it. Sometimes that can even work. But to cut the long story short, um, distract that, um, just change that thought effectively and don't engage with the mouthing. Um, but don't reprimand them so much so that you shut shut them down and they never engage with a human again you don't want to go like that anyway thank you that's good yeah it's good it's interesting what what and what not to do and the reason behind um horses communicating with us too so sometimes you want to engage sometimes you don't okay this is a similar question from Naja. she's following up on her gazy horse that she has um and i think some advice you've given her recently She's found that he usually needs to take a thorough look around the arena and then he's able to concentrate and stay with her. But on the trail, it's a different story. You told an analogy of the tightrope over the Grand Canyon and I interpreted that more looking around needs... I interpreted that with him looking around needs to have more consequences or he needs to find stronger boundaries when drifting off. Can you elaborate a little on how I can work on that? Because I fall right back into micromanaging his reaction to every single distraction. Yes, uh, <laughs> I have a habit of doing that. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting when you're teaching, everything's kind of when I'm working with a horse or I'm answering a question, there's a certain context I've got in my mind. And if you, if you sort of sometimes listen to enough scenarios, you'll find every now and again there seems to be a contradiction 
in one thing that, that, that might be said to another thing that might be said and, and I, can, I can feel in your question there there's probably this contradiction that you're going through well and, and so what I was saying was you know sometimes you want to make a horse feel that they're walking across a tightrope across the Grand Canyon and what I mean by that is the horse is going to put its camera away because it's really con got to concentrate on that tightrope that it's walking across because you're not going to take photos, you won't have time to take photos because there's something that's really important that you're concentrating on and it's kind of like it's a responsibility of you to, to concentrate on that. Um, and on the other hand I said, um, and it was answering your question, don't helicopter focus your horse and that was, um, you know, don't keep going, hey look at me, look at me, look at me. Um, and it's an interesting you know, thing because in one minute I'm saying let your horse look around and let it come back to you and in the other instance walking a tightrope across the Grand Canyon is um, it has to be very responsible. So as when I put that into context um, I'm not going to make a horse walk across a tightrope across the Grand Canyon if I know it's going to fall off the tightrope. So one of those horses so, so, so I'm going to go back to the focusing thing um, and the gazing. So to manage that helicopter focusing, especially when you're just on the ground and things like that, I'm a little firmer on saying keep your thoughts here once, opposed to going over here, over here, over here all the time. So what I mean by that is say for instance I've got my flag um, instead of going, the horse looking away and going over here, over here, every time it looks away, um, I'm going to say, when it looks away, I'm going to go, hey, and I'll do one thing that goes, oh, what was that? And then the horse goes, hang on a minute, and I might only have to do that twice, but then the horse realises, oh, it's its responsibility to keep its thoughts closer to me. Okay, and then when its primary focus is closer to me and, 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 and with me, then it's going to stay with me a little more. When I know it's pretty good at doing that and it can look away and then I can just step over there and it brings its thoughts back stoffily, then I know it's just about ready to sort of engage with something. And then I set up a task for some horses that it has to really think about so it's actually got to go, oh, okay, I don't have time to sort of look around with this. So I get a certain amount of engagement before I set up a task that I expect the horse to um, pay a little more attention to, but it all depends on the horse, see. And that's the hardest thing is, is in the context of horses. Some horses I want to, they need to look and then come back. Other horses, a look just turns into a snowball that if you let it snowball, they're really hard to get back. And it depends if one, if the horse is firstly frightened of you, uh, if the horse is not frightened of you, if the horse is um, um, one of those horses that when it latches onto a strong thought, it won't get let go of it. If it's a horse that just bounces between one thought and the other, they're all very different, so um, you've got to really be careful that you don't micromanage the horse that may need to express itself and then tick that off its bucket list and then they willingly come back. So, you know, with your horse, I guess what I was saying was if it's a horse that needs to look around, which you've found out, then it willingly comes back because it, it kind of has to do that because while you try and make it walk across the Grand Canyon, it's going, but I've got to look at that and that's really frightening me. So basically, you let it engage with its environment a little bit and then as it's engaging with its environment, you set up little tests, which are tests like, can I get you back? Oh, no, you're really hard to get back. Sounds like you're locking, feels like you're locking onto something too much. And I don't think you need to lock onto that. Um, are you locking onto it because you're drawn to it? Are you locking onto it because you're scared of it? If you just want to go out there because you don't want to be with me, then maybe focus on, on me and try again. Or So um, once your horse willingly comes back to you, then when it's out on trail, don't take it so far that it's, it's basically overwhelmed take it out enough that it starts to look about a bit more and just test it, experiment with it. So I've taken you out, okay, things are going good in the arena, I can get your thoughts back nice under saddle and I'm riding you around but I'm taking you out and I'm going to let you think over there a little look at that. Now you've looked at that, if I pick up the rein, are you going to hang on to that? And if the horse hangs on to that thought, well you're going to hang on to that thought, hang on to that rein until they change their thought. 
and then you work in that environment that's not way out there, but it's still in their what I call allied territory, so versus enemy territory. So I'm starting to use that a bit more so people can imagine what it's like for the horse to be past their comfort zone. Past their comfort zone is like a person being in enemy territory. So enemy territory means that everything out there may have a machine gun and you're going to be scared of it. So every kangaroo that hops out behind a bush could potentially have a machine gun to that horse. But if the horse was in allied territory, the horse would go, oh, oh, there's a kangaroo. It's just a kangaroo but it won't have a machine gun. So um, you keep your horse in that more comfortable area outside and you test if it, you can bring its thoughts back easily. And then in its area of being a little bit more out there but still able to bring it back, then you start to say, okay, well, of course you're able to follow my feel and my suggestions and I can bring you back. I'm going to show you something that's quite important so you can think about this and you teach it to follow a feel under saddle until it doesn't have time to look at all those things and then it kind of relaxes into what you're asking and then you leave it and then you go to another spot and you let it drift away again and you just see if you can get it back and engage with it again and maybe with your horse do it in increments until um because some horses you can overwhelm them by trying to make them walk a tightrope across again grand canyon in a sense that you know, it's too much information when they've really got to think about all those things. So if they're overwhelmed with the environment, yes, you do have to be careful that um, you're, you're not trying to um, make them do something that, that makes them feel a little trapped. So build their comfort zones, but build a bit more um, focus and discipline in them, not just discipline in the sense they've got to feel good at focusing and listening to you and and, and, having and having that responsibility and, and, and allowing themselves to hand over responsibility and leadership. So yeah, I hope that's not too... <laughs> uh, I hope you can understand that answer and yeah, just, just work on it more on... Thanks for your questions. If you've got a question of your own that you'd like to ask Mark, he does answer questions from our online members. So online members get access to all of Mark's training videos. There's over 300 now. It's just $15 a month, so it's excellent value to get really specific advice from him plus a whole load of training information just jump online and you can find just google mark and you'll find out how to join there thanks very much and we'll see you soon thank you